you have ears to hear, but you do not hear, and you have eyes to see, but you do not see, and typically that's because we only see what we're looking for. Uh, we don't see much in the world because the only thing we really see is what we personally are looking for. So I have a beige Volkswagen. It's actually Harvest Moon is the actual color of the Volkswagen, according to Volkswagen. When I first moved here, people said, you know, we've never seen a Volkswagen like that. We've never seen a Volkswagen that color. And now you see them all the time. This morning, I came out of my condominium, walked down to the parking lot, and an identical Volkswagen was parked beside my Volkswagen. Exact same color, exact same year. We see them now because we're looking for them. Uh, I, I, have to, I hate to give this away, but I'm going to. One of the best videos on YouTube, this is a spoiler alert, but you're just going have to have to deal with it, is you, you click on the video and it says, count the number of times the basketball is passed on the basketball court. And you watch this, this little clip from a basketball game and you're counting how many times the basketball is passed. And then when the little clip is over, it says at the end, did you see the bear walk across the court? And you back the video up and you realize a man dressed in a bear suit walks right through the middle of the basketball game and you do not see it because you're counting the passes. We typically only see what we're looking for. Uh, that is the case with today's text. This, this story we have read a hundred times about the sower and the seed and those four soils. And I don't know about you, but I'm always looking at the soil. I'm always looking at that hard soil and that shallow rocky soil and that thorny soil and the good soil. And when I hear that parable, it's kind of like Kendra's prayer a moment ago. I'm always thinking about people who fit into those categories because I know some hard rocky soil people and I know some shallow soil people and I know some thorny soil people and I know some good soil people. I, I usually just see what I'm looking for. I've seen people I consider hard soil. Uh, I dropped a lot of gospel seed on the path of Brian's life. Uh, I was a youth minister for five years before entering pastoral ministry. Brian was one of my young people. He was a typical young person, committed to Sunday school, committed to church, committed to mission trips, committed to camps, graduated, went to college. It was while he was in college that he experienced his first hints of bipolar disease. And then he lost a significant family member. And then he got married right out of college and just months later got divorced. The last time I talked to Brian, he said, I'm an atheist. At very least, I'm angry at a God that I'm not even sure exists. The soil was hard. And the seed got carried away by these strange birds of illness and death and betrayal and loneliness. I've known some hard soil. I've known some rocky, shallow soil. Uh, Gary was several years ahead of me in high school, but everyone knew him. He's a great musician. He went to a Billy Graham crusade and got saved, became a Christian, and came back and told some people at our church this is the perfect opportunity for him to finally break into the music business. Instead of pursuing the business he had wanted to pursue, he was now going to pursue the contemporary Christian music business in the late 70s when it was booming. He actually released a couple of albums in the early days of the contemporary music uh, explosion. But in his own words, he got burned out of church. He got burned out with music. He got burned out trying to be good all the time. And currently, Gary works as a cartoon character at a Florida theme park at 60 years of age. It has nothing to do with the church. I've known some shallow, rocky soil that springs up fast and burns away. And we all know some thorny soil. I mean, how many people have we watched who were very active and a part of the life of the church when they were children or when they were young people? And then they went to college, and they got out of the habit of going to church, and life got consumed with classes and syllabi and friends and activities. And then they graduated and life got consumed with job and relationship. And they got so wrapped up in life and everything that grows around them that they just had no time for faith. And then all of a sudden they had a baby. Isn't that when it often happens? You have a child and you realize, wait a minute, I grew up in the faith. And I want my child to grow up in the faith. And they climb out of those thorns and climb out of those thistles and brambles and make their way back to church. I've, I've known some thorny soil. And then there's good soil. And of course, that's all of us. 
That's everybody in this room. You know, we are not shallow, hard, thorny soil in here. We, we are all the good soil. We never have to deal with hard hearts or doubts or shallow faith that comes and goes or the thorny busyness of life. That's not us. We're all good soil. So, so when I read the parable, my mind's eye typically goes to the soil, and I remember and imagine people who exemplify each type of soil. Why? Because I usually see what I'm looking for. It's what I'm looking for. But Scripture, I mean, the whole purpose of biblical Scripture is not to introduce us to each other and each other's faults. The whole point of the Scripture is to put us in communion with God to introduce us to God, to, to give us a glimpse of God. Every verse, every story, every book helps reveal some part of God to us. And if we decide to look for God in this story rather than look for each other, it's not the soil that should grab our attention, but it's the sower. You see, the sower in this story may have been a typical sight in first century Israel, walking along, throwing his seed, but he would not be appreciated in Israel today. Uh, Claudia could speak about this much better than I could and at length, but Israel is well known for her advancements in the area of agriculture, more so than almost any other nation on the face of the earth. With a limited amount of space and a limited amount of water and a limited growing season, they, they have maximized through a variety of methods the output of every acre, every ounce of water, every seed. It's carefully tended and carefully measured. But this sower, this sower wastes three-fourths of the seed. He's just throwing it all over the place. And what does that tell me about God? At times, and you might be able to relate to this, I don't know. At times, my heart is hard and doubtful. At times, my faith is shallow and disinterested. There are times when my life is busy and distracted. There are other times when my mind is open and responsive. But God? God is with me regardless of where I am. I'll say that again. God is with me regardless of where I am. God is revealing God's self regardless of what I'm doing. God is attentive to me when I am and when I am not attentive to God. Isn't this the way we define friendship? Isn't this the way we know somebody really cares about us? Is, are we precious to them even when we aren't acting precious? Carol King wrote it. James Taylor made it popular. We're all going to sing it together this morning. When you're down... No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to sing it. Yeah. yeah. It's when you're down and troubled. When you need a helping hand. When nothing, nothing is going right. Close your eyes and think of me, and soon I will be there to brighten up even your darkest night. You just call out my name, and you know wherever I am, I'll come running to see you again. Winter, spring, summer, fall, all you have to do is call. I'll be there. You have a friend. This, this is the way we describe friendship and intimacy. Best-selling author Karen Salmonson said, if you want to find out who your true friends are, screw up or go through a challenging time, and see who sticks around. Or Anonymous wrote, and Anonymous wrote a lot of quotes, <laughs> Friendship is not who has known you the longest, but who has walked into your life and said, I'm here for you, and then stuck around to prove it. Well, how did the Apostle Paul say it in Romans chapter 5? God has proved God's love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What we see of God in the sower is this, that regardless of where we are in life, we will never be ignored, never be neglected, never be overlooked by God. 
Uh, this month, Ralph Drollinger, who writes Bible study guides for some of our government officials, wrote these words. You probably read about it in the news this week. That God only hears the prayers of Christians who live righteously. You know, it was wrong when Bailey Smith said it as president of the Southern Baptist Convention in 1980, and it is still wrong today. Bailey Smith even suggested that if a Protestant, Catholic, and a Jew were to pray to God, only the righteous Protestant would be heard. Sounds like somebody needs to read the parable of the sower. Because they're only focused on the soil. And they didn't focus on the one who generously and indiscriminately cast the seed everywhere. Why would God not listen to the very people God is talking to? The very people to whom seed has been given and sown. If I focus on the soil, here's what I know. I'm all of those soils. Any day of the week, any day of the month, any day of the year, any day of my life, I don't know about you, but I can be any one of those soils. But if I focus on the sower, then I know that God is truly with us, loving us, gracing us, generously caring for us, regardless of what kind of shape our soil is in. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Loving God, you have not loved us because we are lovable. You have loved us because you are love. We thank you for your great unconditional care for us, for your spirit constantly drawing us to you even when we are pulling away, for every measure of blessing that you give to us even when we don't recognize where the blessing came from. Loving God, for your great care for us, we are grateful. And for those who do not know, have not acknowledged, haven't experienced or named that care, we pray that in these moments they might claim Christ as their Savior, this church as their community, you as their friend. And we pray these things in Christ's name, but for our sakes. Amen.